Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Matthew 5, 9. My name is Reverend Eric Keller. I'm a senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for time, taking time on your busy schedule. You know what? It's an absolutely beautiful day out here, uh, Saturday out here near Bactouche, and it's just, uh, God is so good. And I just want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He's awesome and amazing. I got thinking, in a world that is characterized by self-ambition, a world that's characterized by conflict, a world that's characterized by rivalry, I think it's very difficult to find anyone that could truly be called a peacemaker. I got thinking about the radical transformation process that ultimately occurs when we become born again. There was a time that we were slaves to sin. There was a time that we didn't love God. There was a time in which we thought the, the message of the gospel message, that is, was foolishness to us. There was a time that maybe if we were young and we were inside of the church and we weren't believers yet, that when we sang the songs, they really didn't mean a whole lot. Or when we heard the message or heard God's word spoken, we kind of looked at it and said, yeah, whatever. We weren't overly excited about it. It really didn't bring anything up in us. We didn't leap for joy at all. And then we became born again and everything changed. To be born again means to no longer be a slave to sin, but that of righteousness. Romans chapter number 6. With the Spirit of God living inside of believers, we are equipped and we are expected to walk in the way of love, just as Christ has sacrificed His life for us and showed us how to love. While it is easy, I think, to love those who love us, that's certainly easy, Luke uh, 6.32, most Christians find it exceptionally difficult to become the peacemaker Christ mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, he was not referring to someone who passively imitates the ways of this world to gain their friendship, but instead he's referring to a child of God, a born-again believer who has been radically transformed from spiritual death to spiritual life. He's saying, I want you to make peace with your enemies and with other people. In other words, get other people to make peace with each other. This is what I want you to do because you have been able to, enabled to do it. By their love and personal sacrifice, peacemakers demonstrate reconciliation in such a way that even the spiritually deaf and the blind of this world, who usually don't hear God, they do hear when we're making peace. When we're out there as Christians, born-again believers, and somebody's our enemy and they're attacking us, we're turning the other cheek and we're praising God and we're praying for them, we make a profound statement to this world. God loves them very much. And even though they are God's enemies, He still loves them and He doesn't want them to perish and neither do we. And we can see the image of God in them and we love them so very much that we're going to pray for them. Even if they're mistreating us, we're going to pray for them. I got thinking, wow, never being satisfied with going to heaven alone, peacemakers will personally sacrifice much to make an appeal to humanity to be reconciled with their God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 By their love and their personal sacrifices, peacemakers demonstrate reconciliation in such a way that even the spiritually deaf and blind of this world wake up and they hear and they see that God is wonderful and amazing. Now, do you fit this description? I guess is the question. Do you really fit this? Does this sound like you? Is this something that you do all the time? Am I just preaching to the choir? Or are you like me? You find sometimes this is difficult to do. I think every Christian is in the same boat. We know that we're supposed to be peacemakers. We know that we're supposed to seek reconciliation with God and seek reconcilia reconciliation amongst the people. We know that is true, but that's not easy to do sometimes. Sometimes we sit back and say, why in the world would God ever pick me to be a peacemaker? Because you know what? I don't really feel like one. If you feel that way, then this sermon definitely is for you because it is for me. I got thinking the peace of God. Um, I think that's where we learn how to be peaceful. We don't learn how to be peaceful from this world. This world says if somebody hits you, hit them back. That's the message of this world. They believe in an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They believe ultimately if somebody hits you, you hit them back so hard that they'll never hit you again. That's what the world believes. But that's not what we believe as God's children. And that's not what we're looking for. It says in scriptures, in nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I need my, my mind guarded always by the Lord Jesus Christ. I need God to interfere in my life. 
And to actually tell me, love that person over there who's actually abusing you. Love that person over there who's got bad thoughts about you. Love that person over there who's gossiping about you. Love them. And start praying for them, by all means. Pray for them all the time. It's from God, who is peaceful, that we learn as Christians how to imitate Him and to be peaceful as well. Peace is constant concern in both Testaments in the Bible. And there's a whole bunch of references. Now, if you go on the website, there's a spot where you can click on and you can get the whole sermon. It's all printed out. And you can see all those references. And I want to encourage you to do that because there's lots of references here. But the Father is called the God of Peace and Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. The whole history of redemption, climaxing in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is God's strategy to bring about a just and a lasting peace between rebel man and woman and God and between us. In other words, between humanity, which we like to fight an awful lot. While Jesus is a judge of the living and the dead, he is also peaceful, as demonstrated in his slowness to return. You know, the disciples asked him, you know what, what's going on? When are you going to return? And of course, he says, you know what? I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. And someday I'll come back and I'll get you. And of course, then the people start questioning Paul. They say, Paul, where is he? We thought he was going to come in our lifetime. We thought he'd be here soon. And Paul has to tell the church, oh, by the way, he'll come. But he's going to be slow to come. And the reason why he's going to be slow to come is not to make you wait. He's not that kind of God. He's not the kind of God that's going to, going to force you to wait because he likes to make you struggle. No, he's the kind of God that wants you to wait. Why? Because he loves the people who are dead in their sins and he doesn't want them to perish. So he's going to wait to give them every opportunity to be saved, according to Scripture. Every opportunity. 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Peter 4, 5. Every opportunity. Since an uh, uh, offering of peace has been secured by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we as His image and spirit bearers have been equipped to emulate the Father. The Father who is peaceful. God the Father who is long-suffering, tender, full of loving kindness, pity, and compassion. This is what we're supposed to emulate. Who we're supposed to emulate, I mean. Absolutely. Even though we often feel that we're unworthy, and I know I often feel like I'm worthy, unworthy to do many things that God asked me to do inside of his kingdom, I think ultimately we've been empowered. I think it is the meek, the poor in spirit, the merciful, the pure in heart, and those who thirst after righteousness, they are the ones who are equipped and prepared through the power of God Almighty, through his spirit, to actually get out in the world and say, you need to love each other. You need to love God first and then love one another. We have been equipped to give that message to this world because God has equipped us to do so. We have a glorious message. It's called be reconciled unto God and unto one another. And this is a message that we as Christians were fully capable of giving to this world if we choose to. If God is a peacemaker, then his children who has his nature, 2 Peter 1, 4, will be peacemakers too. The peace of God guards our hearts and thoughts in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might fulfill our call to implore the lost to be reconciled unto God. So, the question is, can we be peacemakers? The answer is yes. It may not feel like that. You may think, well, I don't have quite the temperament, Pastor, to be that. Or I have a hot temper. Or I am very judgmental. Or I have a lot of difficulty with an awful lot of people. The question is, can you be a peacemaker? The answer is yes, but you must turn to God, who is the God of peace. You must turn to the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, and learn from them how to be peaceful with other people and how to bring other people peace to each other. This is important. So that's kind of the first step. If you want to be a peacemaker, turn to God and learn from Him. In other words, that's step number one. Step number two, you become a brand new creation in Christ. You're not going to be able to reconcile this world or have a real big impact upon this world unless you're born again. You really need to be born again to go really deep diving into their souls and saying God loves them. You really need to be born again because it, we're going to find out in a moment it's the Spirit of God that really makes the difference. I got thinking that uh, this beatitude gives us a glimpse, uh, John Piper says, in, in the way we're supposed to be. If you look at it, we're supposed to be merciful, we're supposed to be meek, we're supposed to thirst after righteousness, and yes, we're supposed to be peacemakers. When we go from the old self to the new self, it's supposed to be radical. I know some people that's not the case. There are some people in their Christianity, it takes them a while to really get transformed. In other words, to really start walking down the right path. They're transformed, yes. They have the Holy Spirit living inside them, but sometimes it takes them a while to be sanctified. In other words, to become more like Christ and to get closer to Him. But I want to uncover a falsehood. 
There's a false belief out there, ultimately, that we can do whatever we want once we get saved. And we can just do anything that we feel like and we can participate in all the sins of this world and God's okay with it. And that's a falsehood. That's not true. Not at all. If in, in your conversion, when you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you never ever changed, if you never got a thirst for God's word, if you never liked you know singing the hymns, or you never saw the love of God in your hearts, and if you never surrendered your heart to him, and you never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, then you're not saved. It's just, a, it's just as simple as that. I know it's a little bit scary. And if you're not, I want to encourage you. You can fix that right now. You can get down on your hands and knees and say, Lord Jesus Christ, please forgive me. Please come into my heart. Please be the Lord of my life. You can fix that right now. But if you've never, ever changed when you said yes to Jesus in any way, then there's a pretty good chance you're not saved and you need to fix that. But if you are changing and if you do see that new self as making a radical difference in your life, guess what? It really is going to make a radical difference. You're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. You're no longer under condemnation anymore. You no longer have eternal death, but now you have eternal life. At one time, you did not have the Spirit living inside of you, but now you do. You, at one time, you could not please God, but now you can. You are a child of God, a masterpiece of His grace. You are Christ's ambassadors. Wow! Lots of descriptions for us, isn't there? Our transformation is radical. To be born of the Spirit and water is a radical transformation of going from death to that of life. The moment one believes, I think our minds are open because in scriptures it says what we used to think was foolishness. In other words, if you went to church when you were younger and you weren't saved, you'd often sit back and say, oh, why do I have to sing the songs? They don't really give me anything and I don't really like them. Or you, you said, you know what, why is he reading God's word? I don't find anything spectacular about it. But the second you get saved, everything changes. The words of those songs are the same, but boy, your heart leaps for joy. And when you hear God's word, it's like, it's amazing. And you feel great and joy, wonderful joy. I think it's awesome. John Piper rightly says that Beatitudes are like long spikes holding down the lid of a coffin of false teaching that states, once I am born again, I don't need to do anything for God. Once you're born again, you're going to want to do everything for God. Everything. Because you love Him. And you've tasted His love. And you've been in His presence. And you have His Spirit living inside of you. You're going to want to do everything for God. Because you're a brand new creation in Christ. You will no longer be lukewarm. You'll no longer want to live the ways of this world. You'll want to be like Jesus. Because you love Him. Since the children of God have reconciled, have received His Spirit, they've been reconciled unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ ambassadors are empowered and expected to live and help others become peaceful in their relations, first with their master and then with one another. The rest of the sermon is going to talk about how do I become a peacemaker? So the first step is to look at God. If we're going to be peacemakers, we're going to have to first look at the peace of God. We're going to have to say, if I'm going to be a peacemaker, I've got to learn from God. I've got to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ how to be peaceful. Number two, I can't even do that if I'm not a born-again believer. So I must be a born-again believer. So, the rest of the sermon doesn't matter if you're not a born-again believer. You're not going to be able to be the kind of peacemaker that God wants you to be until you're first reconciled unto Him. So, if you're not a believer, turn the tape on pause, go and ask Jesus Christ in your heart. Okay? If you are a believer, you have been radically transformed and you are now capable of being a peacemaker. Not only in your own life, but in other people's lives as well. Let's talk about that. There's going to be a couple of things that, that you're going to need to do and there's going to be a, a couple of things that you're going to do out in the world. But let's start off first. What do I need to do in order to prepare myself to help others be reconciled unto God? And I think the very first thing is, is to learn how to love our own enemies. It's not easy to love your enemies. It's a, it's a really difficult thing. What would it be like for you, for instance, just imagine for a moment. Go way back in, in Jesus' day. Jesus up on doing the Sermon on the Mount. He's up most likely on a hill. And here you are sitting out with a big crowd of Jewish people, your comrades, your friends, your relatives. You're all sitting out there and you're wondering. You've been talking about this and you're wondering, when's the Messiah going to come? And if this possibly is the Messiah, then he's come to destroy Rome. Rome's our enemy. They're the ones that are giving us all these exorbitant taxes. They're the ones who are keeping us under the thumb. Well, if Jesus truly is a Messiah, he's coming with a sword. He's going to destroy all of Rome and put us back on our pedestal. This is going to be a glorious and wonderful thing. So you're sitting down to hear from this fellow who claims to be the Messiah. And you sit back and say to yourself, I wonder if it's possibly true. So you sit back and you're listening to him. And he comes out and he says this. 
He says, but those who are listening, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who mistreat you. Can you imagine what they would have felt like? They were not necessarily grabbing on to the message very well. They were hearing one thing and they were hoping for something else. They were hearing Jesus say, you got to love your enemies. You got to pray for them. You got to spend time with them. You've got to do good to them. And they're going, whoa, hold on a second. We want you to destroy them. And you're saying you're going to love them. And, and worse yet, you're saying that you're going to go on the cross and you're going to die for them. We were hoping you're going to destroy them. We weren't hoping that they were going to destroy you, your physical body. We don't like this at all. This is not the plan that we had. We don't enjoy this. Jesus' teaching was radical for instead of saying it's okay to do an eye for an eye, he said, ultimately, Christians, through their loving kindness and their desire to promote peace, this is how you show the world how to be peacemakers. This is how you make an impact to the world. We've all met somebody, and I think we all have, somebody who doesn't like us. Somebody who really wants to do us great harm. We've all met somebody who ultimately, if we walked on one side of the road, they'd probably walk on the other. We've all met somebody who gossips, backbites, and says all sorts of bad things about us. We've met people like that in our lifetime, and we will probably meet a few more. Jesus said, you've got to love these people with all your heart, mind, and soul. You've got to spend time with them. You've got to pray for them. You've got to do good to them. You know what? That's radical teaching. It was radical teaching for the people in Jesus' day, especially for the Sermon on the Mount. It's still radical today. Because the world tells us eye for an eye is the way to go. If somebody harms you, you beat them down as hard as you possibly can. Because you know what? If you don't, they're going to come back and hit you again. And you don't want that. So beat them down hard. And they'll never come back again. That's what the world says. But God says no. True, true peacemakers will pray that they might be living sacrifices so that their good deeds might point to God the Father in heaven and that whoever their enemies might be, they might be first reconciled unto God. That's peacemaker. The letting their light shine often leads to persecution. Peacemakers choose not to take an eye for an eye, but instead forbear the blows of their enemies and never stop praying for their conversion and their sanctification. A true peacemaker would rather their enemy gossip, backbite, fight, and try to destroy them than they would ever lift a hand to harm them. That's a peacemaker. That's a, one of God's peacemakers. That is. And I got thinking. They don't want to hurt others. They want to love them. They are slow to anger and judgment and hope that through their personal sacrifices, evil might be overcome with good. That's what scripture talks about. Even though attainment of peace is not always possible, like Jesus, peacemakers never stop pointing to loving God and loving one another as a fulfillment of all of God's laws. They live that in the way they relate to one another. If you want to make, be a peacemaker, and, and I certainly want to be a peacemaker, and I'm sure you do as well, then first and foremost, you must love your enemies. It's not just something for somebody else. It's easy to point to other people and say, you, all of you out there, not me, but all of you out there, you've got to love your enemies. But it's another thing to sit back and say, i got to love all my enemies. And if you want to be a peacemaker, first you've got to love your enemies. Because I can tell you, you can go out in the world and tell them, oh, you guys all got to love your enemies. And they're not going to hear a single word you have to say until you actually love your own. Everyone. Nothing hurts a, a peacemaker's credibility any faster than having hatred for somebody else. Nothing destroys a credibility, credibility any quicker. I got thinking, the next step that a person must take if they want to be a, a peacemaker, a born-again believer, is to be very quick to forgive. I got thinking about the church, and I got thinking about uh, my experiences with the church over my lifetime, and I can say that the offenses that I usually see are the deepest the cuts are the absolute sharpest inside of the church than they are anywhere else. You would think ultimately the world be, would be the ones that would have a problem with making peace with each other, but often it isn't the world, it's the people inside of the church. We don't do a very good job of emulating God's love when it comes to forgiveness. Sometimes people rub us the wrong way. Sometimes people have, have songs they like, a flavor of song that we don't like. Or sometimes people have an interpretation of God's word that we don't appreciate. Or sometimes people live their lives differently than we, what we do. And as a result of that, we don't like it very much. And oftentimes our differences we don't celebrate, but instead we go to war against each other. 
I know Christians, born-again believers, that say they love God very deeply, that the moment that their enemy shows up in their presence, they leave. If they're in the middle of a church service and their enemy shows up, they'll leave the building, literally, because they feel they're right and they're justified. And I got thinking that's not the way that God wants us to be. Building bridges and tearing down animosity is only possible, I think, when both parties are more interested in a healthy relationship with one another than being vindicated or being right. That should be our goal. Our goal is not to prove my position or my point of view. My goal when I want to make peace with my enemy is to get that peace. It's to show my enemy that, guess what? I love you very much. Unconditionally, I do. And as a result of that, I'm willing to give you whatever I need to give. I'm going to give you my love. I'm going to give you my heart. I love you very much because you're created in the image of God and Christ has forgiven me for so very many of my sins that you know what? I'm willing to forgive you for anything you've done to me because I've done far worse to Christ. Reality is I am the one and so is all everybody else on the face of this planet. We are the ones who ultimately drove the nails into Christ's hands and feet. We're the ones. We did it. It was our disobedience that got him there. So we can't go to somebody else and get on our high horse and say, oh, by the way, you said something bad about me, therefore I'm never going to forgive you. Because it says in scriptures, if you take that attitude, then God won't forgive you. When you come to Christ and say, please forgive me, I did some wrong. Well, if you don't forgive your enemies, Christ's going to look at you and say, forgive your enemy first, then come back and see me. This is what it says in scriptures. True peace, peacemakers do not curry gossip. <coughs> Pardon me to win favor for the position, but instead they keep no records of wrongs. True peacemakers do not nurse grudges, nor do they entertain vengeance, but instead look for ways to tear down barriers between themselves and their enemies. The meek and the lowly in heart would rather bear injury, slurs, and injustices than cause harm to anybody else. God's peacemakers would never dream of leaving the church or walking outside on the other side of the street when they meet one of their enemies. Instead, they always got their arms open wide because they want to hug them and reconcile with them. They consider it an honor ultimately be in presence of their enemies and the opportunity to say, I love you. And when it comes to forgiveness, looking at the stripes by which their sins cause Christ to get on that cross, they themselves are always ready, always ready to say, I forgive you the moment you confess and say, I'm sorry. Rightly, they forgive their offenders, not of, uh, out of naivety, but with the assurance that they will be judged in the same manner by their God, Matthew 7, 1 to 2. And even when it is not possible to have reciprocal forgiveness with somebody else, they never stop praying. You will meet people in your life that you cannot be friends with. You cannot reconcile with them. You could do anything. You could give them a million dollars. You could do absolutely anything for them and they would never say, I love you, I care for you, I want to be around you. They just won't. There are people like that. And when you meet somebody like that, you try to reconcile with them. That's your obligation in front of God. But if you can't reconcile with them, if you've done everything you can think of and everything God has asked you to do to reconcile and they still say no, then guess what? You're not done yet. You're not going to wash your hands of them. Your goal now is to pray, 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 pray. Pray for them. Do good to them. Love them. Continue to love them. That God's grace might be poured into their hearts and they might come to their senses and they might realize they've got to love you because you're an image bearer of God. And you've got to love them. I got thinking, once we actually got to the point where we've understood loving our enemies and we've got to the point where now we're talking about forgiveness and we've got there and we're a brand new creation in Christ. We've got all the components that we need to get out in the world and tell people about Jesus and all about how his grace and his love is supreme. We're able to do so. Now the question is, how do you reconcile other people? Now that you've got your reconciliation done with each other, how do you get out in the world and tell the world, oh, by the way, you can be rec reconciled with one another? I think, ultimately, instead of delighting in division, bitterness, or strife, or some other petty conquer and divide mentality, I think the disciples of Christ need to make peace wherever they can amongst the people of this world. They are to teach opposing parties, to see the planks in their own eyes, so that the bridge of offense might be seen as mutual, and therefore forgivable by both parties. 
If you get in a situation or you see somebody or others, two other people in a situation where they don't like each other, where they've caused offense to one another, explore. In most cases, not always, but in most cases, both parties will have something they've done wrong. And as a result of that, you can say to them, you're both in the wrong and therefore you both need to ask and receive forgiveness from each other. It can be a wonderful bridge if you can find it. And again, not, not always is this the case. Sometimes some people actually do wrong to another person and they just simply didn't deserve it. I got thinking, there are limits ultimately to our effort at reconciliation. God's peacemakers would never compromise righteousness, even if it meant in doing so, the two enemies with each other, they'd actually attain peace. The steps and the way in which one makes peace with another must align with God's words at all times. For instance, one does not fabricate a stronger enemy in order to get two enemies to get along with each other. Absolutely not. And one certainly does not ignore the sins of another in order to get the bonds of peace. I've heard that many times stated when two Christians get in a fight with each other. Somebody will come along and say, and it is in scriptures, but they take it out of context. They say, you know what? Better to be offended my brother. Much better to be offended my sister. And you know what? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's all good. Don't ignore their sins. Don't bother looking at their sins at all, but just let that go and just keep moving forward. You know what? That doesn't really get reconciliation though, does it? The reality is you got to deal with those sins. You got to spend time with them. You got to flesh them out. You got to be ready to forgive them for their sins. Absolutely. They don't need your forgiveness necessarily. They need God's first and foremost, but they also need your forgiveness too, partially so that your relationship with them might be restored, made whole again. So forgive them. Forgive them because that's important. The steps, ultimately, we make peace with one another, must align with God's word at all times. Purity in the eyes of God cannot be compromised. For while peace between mortals might be obtained by breaking his commands, this surely will create enmity with our creator. So as peacemakers, we only do what is in the pure in the eyes of God to maintain the bonds of peace. And we don't go anywhere beyond that. Definitely not. And I want to finish kind of with this one here. The last real thing that we got to make sure, if you're going to go out there and make peace with other people to encourage reconciliation, make sure your heart is pure. That's incredibly important. Nothing worse than a Christian going out there and telling people, you've got to get along with one another when they've got a whole bunch of people in their life that they hate and they don't get along at all. There's nothing worse than a Christian going out in the world and saying they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they only read God's word, but they don't actually obey it. Nothing hurts their credibility any faster when they don't actually bow their knee to God. Nothing destroys our credibility any quicker than, than us not saying yes to Jesus in everything in our life. What makes our light, our light truly shine is not passive observance or lip service to he who brought us at a price, but out of complete love and complete surrender and complete submission to his will, we do what he says. When people see that, they know it's an ambassador of Christ who's coming to see them. They know it's somebody who's real, somebody who truly believes, somebody who's in love with God and in love with them. They know that you are genuine, and that makes a huge difference. Since mediocrity leads to hypocrisy, successful efforts to keep the bonds of peace are only attainable when one first reconciles with one's Redeemer, and then, if possible, with one's own enemies. Blessed are the pure in heart, for not only will they receive glimpses of God, but they will also shine so brightly that others will see their love as proof they have transformed from spiritual death to life. When one considers that it is better than oneself, when one forbears and forgives one's enemies, the roots of one's life are firmly planted in fertile soil of a peaceful harvest. Now I want to say, when you go out there and you try to make peace with warring factions, you're not responsible for the harvest, though. Only God can make people get along, I think. You know what? Yes, certainly people do get along in this world without God. But when people really get entrenched and they get angry and they get bitter and they get nasty with each, each other... And literally, they're more than willing to, you know, walk on the other side of the road when they see their enemy. Only God can break down that aminosity. Only God can save a person. Only God can make a person go from death to life. Only God can do that. You're not responsible for that, but what you are responsible for, and so am I, and that is to tell them about God and His love and always point them to the peace of God so that that might come into their hearts and they might share it with one another. 
In conclusion, just because living in a world that is characterized by selfish ambition, conflict, and rival, rivalry, it is exceedingly difficult to find a peacemaker, that doesn't mean that they do not exist. Yes, there are peacemakers in this world. There are bona fide, born-again believers who ultimately love God so intensely that they share their love with this world and they can bring people together who are at war with each other. When the Jewish people heard the Messiah came not to destroy her enemies, but to sacrifice his own life for them, they were troubled. But with the gift of hindsight, we know that Christ's atonement paved the way for reconciliation with God. Those who have gone from spiritual death to life have the Spirit of God living inside of them and therefore are capable of not only seeing others better than themselves, but also to forbear, forgive, and unconditionally love them. While reconciliation is possible out of a desire to not only um, to go to heaven alone, basically, the peacemakers will sacrifice much to proclaim the message that God wishes none to perish. The good news is that as long as they have breath, they can make a decision and believe in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. They can be adopted as God's children and spend an eternity with him. Since uh, being doers of the word ultimately is the key to eliminating hypocrisy, peacemakers will only do what is right in God's sight to seek reconciliation between themselves and enemies and two people who are enemies themselves. I want to finish with this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they. It's not easy to be a peacemaker. It's not easy to forbear other people that are trying to destroy you. It's not easy to put up with other people's anger and bitterness and strife. It's not easy to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes just to get an understanding of them so that you can try to work with them and try to find a way that they can get along with their enemies. It's not easy to do any of these things. It's not easy to show unconditional love, especially when a lot of people are filled with hatred angerness, bitterness, strife, and they're very, very selfish and they only look at their own selves. It's not easy, but God asks us to do it. Why? Because he's enabled us to do it. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. We know what to do. We have God living in us. We know what to do. We know how to love the people around us. And if you don't know how to do that, Turn to God. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at their example in Scripture. He tells us over and over again how to love people, to love Him and love each other. It's told all throughout Scriptures. Learn it and live it. Because this world needs more peacemakers. Certainly, yes, they do. Amen and amen.